Thanks a lot for coming to today's panel discussion on utility token. <coughs> My name is Andreas Glarner, I'm partner of the crypto team at NME. I'm going to moderate the panel today. Uh, as I said, we're going to focus on utility to tokens, on the functionalities, on the ecosystem they live in, and also on regulatory aspects. For that, we have a great international panel, which I'd like to welcome here today. Um, I, I received all the CVs of the members. It's like, it was about this, that much documentation. If I would read that through, who achieved what in, in the past life and in blockchain technology, we'll spend the first 15 minutes only on that. So I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to quickly present all of the panelists today. They have been in the blockchain and smart contract space for the past couple of years. They have a lot of practical experience. They have a lot of exposure with the regulators and discussions. They have been engaged in policy making. And so they've all really profound and best experts from their jurisdictions we have. And I'd like to introduce you. We first have. Uh, we have on my left, Veronique Dali from Malta. Then we have Josh Clayman from the US in New York. We have Daniel um, Rezas from Germany. Nina Siedler also from Germany and from Enemy. We have Stefan Meyer. And we have Nick uh, Brahms from the UK. Nigel Brahms. And we have Rachel Paris from New Zealand all the way across the ocean. Um, for those of you who believe that Germany may be a bit overrepresented today, <laughs> sitting in the middle of the tour, it has nothing to do with uh, uh, the Mexican disaster last year. <laughs> <that> they, <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> again? So they, <laughs> it's not about scoring for sure this time. <laughs> well, as I said, we're going to talk about utility token, and uh, I've been at consensus a uh, couple of weeks ago, and uh, one phrase I often heard at consensus was, well, the utility tokens are dead. Now we only have asset token, there's no more room for utility token. So the question is, is it actually worth spending the next 14 minutes discussing about utility token? Josh, what do you think of that? It, does it make sense what you do here today? So, you know, I think a little while ago people were saying exactly what you're saying, at least in the US, that, you know, there's no such thing as a utility token, all of these are securities. However, with a recent speech last week by Director Hinman of the SEC's Division of Corporate Finance, he, he basically said that it's Ether, the native token of the Ethereum blockchain. If you hold aside, however, it may have been sold in the beginning, at this point, it's not a security. And that's huge. And he talked about decentralization. So I think the, we're starting to explore that again in the US, and maybe, maybe it needs a new name, but... <laughs> But I, I suppose we can talk about that, yeah. Great. So, yeah, let's talk about that. Uh, I think a good starting point, what I would like to go through today's discussion is start about how different regulators define utility token. And the question, does that make sense? Or we, from a practical point, would we use different definitions for, for the term? Maybe even different names, as you possibly proposed, and also then have a bit of a look on the regulatory side, what the implications are if you issue such utility token in the future. In the different jurisdictions, I think it should be kind of a discussion round, so it's not me, only me asking questions. You have now here all the great experts from around the world, so if there are any questions from the audience, please feel free to jump up and ask them while they come to your head. You also might interrupt me if you think or have some issues which I want to discuss, I think we should make the best out of the, this great possibility we have today. Um, when I look back in, in February 2018, FEMA, that's the Swiss regulator, which you're all familiar with, they, they issued their guidelines on initial coin offering. And as part of the guidelines, uh, they made a categorization of token. And basically, out of this categorization, the regulatory framework is being derived from. Um, they did a simplified categorization. They differed between three token types. We probably all know them. It's the payment token with the background of email regulations uh, that they should be applicable. We have the asset token, so the security token type. And FEMA says, well, there is a utility token. And in principle, with some exceptions, if you issue a utility token, no regulations apply. Um, thereby, FEMA 
argued that the utility token is a token which grants you an access right to an infrastructure, a service or a application which is being provided based on blockchain technology. That's the <coughs> idea, the concept FEMA made. So I, I would like to start with uh, like a big round and starting with New Zealand this time uh, is do you have a regulator which tries to define what a utility token is or what is the situation? Yeah, so um, our regulator that is relevant in this area is the Financial Markets um, Authority, so the securities regulator, and they have recognised utility tokens. Almost, um, they've defined it negatively as something that's not a security and not a currency or payment token. So this idea of providing utility to access a platform or a network, um, but they haven't gone into any further detail. So this is... Um, I guess where it can be confusing around if you have a utility network where incentive tokens are airdropped, you know, as a loyalty reward, whether that is something, a feature that could maybe move it into the security definition. Um, but generally, yeah, they've, they've followed the FIMA approach. So basically the approach would be if it's not a security, it most likely is a utility. Correct. Without knowing what the utility is. Yeah, without is. getting into any okay. real uh, clarification. Okay. Yeah. What about the UK? In the UK, um, we're kind of look, a little bit scratching around for clues from our, our main regulator in the space is the Financial Conduct Authority, although the Bank of England have also made some sort of pronouncements. Um, we don't really have an awful lot to go on. It's more kind of, it's more what we've been, it's more kind of by omission. So the regulator issued a statement last year to say that um, uh, some ICOs, basically say ICOs are risky, if you buy them you might lose your money. Some ICOs are regulated, some ICOs are not regulated. Um, and it depends on how, what form the ICO takes. Um, so effectively what they're saying there is, and then they made another pronouncement to say that if your IC, that they don't think cryptocurrencies should, are, are regulated instruments, but they think derivatives on cryptocurrency are regulated. So what we're kind of defining, and, and effectively it's been left to us as lawyers to try and interpret that, and what the view that we're taking, and and we've had, if you have, an, you can have informal conversations with people you know at the regulator, and I've had that, and, and the actual, the regulator's view is actually quite supportive. If, I mean, it's not a formal view, it's an info, the informal view is actually, no, we really like the, we like the space, we like the crypto space, we, had, we don't really have an issue with utility tokens. Um, but, it, but there isn't a formal pronouncement to that effect, but it's kind of where, if you talk to people in the space in the UK, that's kind of what we're, rely, we're relying on at the moment. Okay, interesting. Um, Nina, Germany, what do you think would this kind of definition which FEMA made for Switzerland, the access right to applications or infrastructure which are blockchain, blockchain technology based, would that be something which fits also in the mindset of a German regulator? We rather define um, the other way around. So we are looking at token and then trying to figure out whether that token could constitute a security token and then everything that is left could either be <coughs> an asset or utility token or a cryptocurrency so similar to the and new zealand yeah but it, and very similar yes um, German BaFin issued some guidance um, a couple of months ago, um, basically referring to the Mifid securities definition, um, but without really giving you know construction of that terms used there uh, with regard um, to tokens. But um, and, and then they announced you know that they would do a case by case analysis. Um, and we, you know, working on those cases and seeing the feedback, uh, I think we can confirm that Bafin recognizes um, the, the, the utility token class as such, um, but it's still not absolutely clear how far it goes. There are very few cases so far where they confirmed that the token indeed does not constitute any kind of financial instrument, which is the even more important um, and, and wider definition of instruments that is regulated um, and securities only form a part of that, right? Okay. Yeah, let's jump to Malta, Veronique. Do you have any definition on, by the regulator now which yes. kind of says, well, the regulator believes a utility token exists and how would it be defined? Yes, um, 
And when we designed the bills which are addressing this scenario, um, uh, we had in mind more a concept which is centered, I would say, around the concept of a virtual asset. So the definition under Maltese law practically falls, um, uh, is categorized um, uh, on two, two classes. So that's the security token and the utility token. But um, our a security token would be a, vir a virtual financial asset under Maltese law, and a utility token would be a virtual token. The implication is very similar. Um, I would say practically mirrors New Zealand's definition, um, Germany's definition, um, practically the, 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 the changing um, scenario, it's, it's, it's being mirrored um, uh, by the MFSA. However, um, it eliminates the use of, I would say, um, it, it eliminates the store of value. It goes by elimination. It eliminates the store of value. It eliminates also any financial instrument. And it is also envisaging the possibility that a utility token might be acquired initially as a utility token. But eventually, if the holder is holding on to that token, in with the expectation of it increasing in value, um, it does not completely omit the possibility of it being eventually um, regarded as a security token. However, the test lies ultimately with the MFSA. So it is the MFSA who will finally have the final word as to whether that token was issued as a utility token or whether it was issued as a security token. We are awaiting um, uh, MFSA to issue a financial instruments test. So far, we have guidelines, but it practically mirrors how we test. It practically mirrors and analyzes the mechanics of the token, the way it's being advertised, whether the investor is being proposed with a token with the expectation of making profit, or whether the user is being proposed with a token which will grant access. So um, the element of the way it's being proposed to the eventual um, uh, acquirer is also taken into account so when many, classifying. It's a, it's a test with many kind of elements to it. So there's no clear definition by the regulator. No, we'll, because this we all, is... Yeah, we all know that Malta is currently working on new regulations. Yes, Maybe it is. To share whether this regulation will include a clear definition in the, of the utility token? Yes, it will include it a, will. Um, a clear definition. Um, uh, also, because after the introduction of the laws, um, MFSA is going to issue guidelines which we are awaiting <coughs> to be published after the summer recess. Um, uh, and uh, ultimately, the test is still works in progress. So we are checking with MFSA and every week, and they're being bombarded um, with questions. But um, the truth is that the test <coughs> will um, analyze the mechanics of it and uh, the, this definition that was proposed in the virtual financial assets does give an indication. So it won't be any surprise for anyone. Um, it will uh, be pretty much moving into the direction which is it's indicating always. one route or the other, but ultimately it lies with MFSA to have that say. Can I ask no, you a question? Please. Is it possible that we're precluding the possible, we have this great digital creative possibilities with the, with the digital currencies. So is it possible this categorization is precluding the opportunity of, of, a, of a digital currency that is a medium of exchange providing fundamental utility that actually has qualities of, a, of, a, of a remuneration in, in addition to the, to the primary functionality of, of, as a medium of exchange. So by, by establishing these legal categories, we're precluding fundamentally currencies that are, that are more competitive than the, than the government's own currencies. They, for, for instance, their government currencies are not asset backed, which makes them less legitimate, and nor do they provide any kind of return that might be based on the, the expansion of the money supply, for instance. So this this preconceived um, or this this emerging uh, categorization may be undermining the future potential of 
the digital currencies and the, and the possibilities there. No, in, interesting thought. Um, maybe from from a Swiss perspective, the, uh, I think looking at the. the token landscape at the time being, I think none of them would really qualify as a currency, uh, lacking the liquidity, lacking the, the use case as a currency, even though technically that would be possible. So I think when you issue a new token, while that could become a currency in one day, become accepted as a mean of payment, a mean of value, uh, I think most tokens currently lack this function. But uh, I don't know, maybe... Uh, so I, go? Um, I think... The UK is a common law jurisdiction, so typically if something is regulated, then it's regulated, and if it doesn't fall into the category of regulation, it's outside that, because so, our general approach is not, is not to categorise very much, so it's kind of regulation by omission, or <coughs> lack of regulation by omission, if you see what I mean. So what we would be doing effectively is looking at your, do you fit into any of the categories, and if you don't fit into that category, you're probably not regulated, whereas I suspect in a more uh, statute-based system, um, if you're not in that category, you've got uncertainty. So, it's, it's, I mean, I don't think, personally, I think we need more guidance in the UK. We, had, we don't have enough. Um, and, it, and we're kind of interpreting by omission by the regulator. Perhaps it's prematurely too, too forceful with any strict categorization and, and be more concerned with what are the possibilities I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean our, our regulators basically said if it's not regulated, it's not regulated. If it's covered by our uh, regulated activity order, which is the order government issues and updates from time to time and gives a whole list of all the all, uh, regulated instruments, a lot of which comes out of MIFID too, but not everything. And there's got quite a lot of local stuff in there as well. But if it doesn't fall into that category, our approach and the regulator's approach will be, well, that's probably not regulated. Or maybe they need to regulate it, but they're not doing it at the moment. <laughs> Right? It's not if, unfortunately, that's that's the case, right? So, so if you're not, well, if, I, if, I, yeah. But if you're not if you're not regulated under the you know financial regulatory rules, you will always in the EU uh, be caught by you know e-money, um, consumer protection, there are all some sorts things. of things, right? So there are a few areas which are not regulated. I mean, you're right. I mean, things like payment services. Etc. E money is all regulation. There are a few areas like FX, spot FX is not regulated. No, I mean outside of the financial regulatory yes. area. No. Yes. Right. Yeah. What What I would like to do, I think, Josh, because uh, when you talk about utility token and how uh, regulators approach that, and if something is regulated, or not it will depend on the jurisdiction. But you mentioned the SEC and the ether, and and that it's not qualified as security. So, I, so I, what do you think of the discussion? Well, I I so far. What I was, what Nina just said, actually, I was thinking myself, which is at least in the U.S. I mean, we have a situation where there are so many potential regulations, right, that could apply. That it's kind of like, well, how do you figure out how they do apply and which ones may not, as opposed to going from completely regulated to completely unregulated. So even if you have something that is not a security, it doesn't mean that you still wouldn't be subject to you know, rules from FinCEN and, and other regulators, you could end up having a commodity. For example, Bitcoin, you know, the SEC generally has said that that is not, like Chairman Clayton recently said, that he didn't see Bitcoin as being a security, right? But the CFTC calls it a commodity, right? And the IRS calls it a property. So there's so many different, um, different things in the U.S. that it's challenging that way. I will say one thing really interestingly, really interesting to me is what Wyoming did, um, which was base guidance off of FINMA guidance um, and passed House Bill 70, which uh, was nearly unanimously passed, was saying that actually within the state of Wyoming, the, that state takes the view that there is such a thing as a utility token. If you have a token, blockchain-based token, it has a consumptive, like a consumer purpose. So I think... I think we're inching that way. I think the regulators are in a tough spot if you think about it because we've all been attracted to this technology and so have the scammers, right? So there's a tension between regulators wanting to encourage economic growth and you know not stifle innovation and yet at the same time have a way to police people to make sure there's adequate disclosure and, and adequate penalties for those who want to take advantage of of unsophisticated persons. Well, yeah. going through that round, 
and just 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 one further remark, yeah. following up on what Nina just said, is and 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 it's it's important to realize that even non-financial regulation might be the more suitable way to to grasp a, a hybrid phenomenon like a utility token. This is something we well people start realizing <coughs> that. I think Nina came up with the idea of, well month ago, <laughs> is, was, has been promoting this uh, all the time. But um, especially in, 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 in other jurisdictions, we, 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 we don't see people embracing this concept of, of e-commerce regulation or consumer protection uh, regulation as a, as a viable means of regulating utility tokens. And this is something we should definitely give a second or third thought. Oh, definitely, I couldn't agree more. But I think we can conclude that uh, I think the Swiss regulator so far is the only one which proactively stepped out and tried to define uh, uh, what, what the utility token is for them. Obviously coming with a regulatory view on things. What, what I'd like to do now is kind of go away a bit on the regula regulatory, regulatory side and not discuss about what regulations may or may not apply that will differ from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. But what is and that's what we have tried to do with our BCP paper, kind of look at the functionality and let's see whether we can agree what a utility show token should be defined as. As I said, FIMA said, well, it's an access right to a, a blockchain technology-based infrastructure or uh, application. Um, when we look at the, the paper, and I think you should have copies of it on your desk, um, the same idea is kind of reflected in, in this analysis here. It is very simplified. We don't need to go into details. But our assessment was basically um, that it per se utility token, tokens lack any counterparty. So you don't have any claim against anyone, but you have only an access right to a decentralized application. <coughs> uh, Stefan, do you want to kind of explore a bit on, on the idea on, yeah. on this native utility token model we have in here, so we can discuss that idea in, in our panel. There, as uh, Andreas mentioned, uh, FIMO has also three uh, categories of tokens, uh, payment tokens, utility tokens, and asset tokens, uh, which uh, provides a very good uh, guidance and a high level of uh, legal certainty. However, the categories of FIMO are quite vague, and. Uh, FIMA acknowledged that there are uh, hybrid forms of tokens, so our idea was to, to enhance uh, the model of FINMA and to provide deeper guidance uh, in order to classify token uh, and then, based on that, uh, doing the, the legal evaluation of tokens. And on the left side, uh, our, we, we called it the BCP, uh, Blockchain Crypto Property, and on the left side we have the BCP Class 1 which we call the native utility tokens. And as Andreas also mentioned, the native utility tokens are tokens without a counterparty. So if I hold a native utility token, I do not have a claim, a specific claim against a counterparty. So here we have the, the decentralized ecosystems. And uh, in the middle, the BCP class two, these are the, the classical asset tokens. And there we have counterparties and here we are definitely in the, the securities area, <coughs> and on the right side, uh, our BCP class 3 are the ownership tokens which are intended to, to transfer ownership or absolute rights, for example, on IP, maybe on copyrights, and uh, this is also from a legal perspective a, a different thing, such a token, so we have uh, elaborated a, a different category. Let's so. stall here for for time being. What, what I would be very curious to hear, now we have seen we have the counterparty less token, token which grant rights for, to, for usage to a decentralized application. You, you don't have anybody giving you that right. This thing, this application operates decentralized on a blockchain. Um, then we have the counterparty token, they have some kind of claim, could be anything, share of revenue, whatever, so we clearly are very close to securities. And then you have the absolute right token, which represent a, a property right. If we look at this counterparty-less token, this, this idea, uh, and I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on that, that if you don't have a counterparty, can it be a security at all? Because you're lacking any claim towards anyone. What would New Zealand think of that? Would that be possible to have a counterless party token and still be a security? 
Um, I don't think so, but it's interesting. I don't think any regulators anywhere have really looked at this issue from the counterparty perspective. I think that's why the BCP paper is such an important contribution to the discussion, because from a legal perspective, that's everything. Um, you're right. I don't think once it becomes sufficiently decentralised, it could ever meet the security definition. Problem is, at an ICO um, stage, you, you do have some kind of issuer, right? So, so it often maybe could start as a security. And then, as we've seen in the US, you know, being recognised this week, it can then maybe change um, over time. Yeah. So, I think that's something maybe it's important for us all to explore. Michael, if you want to add um, something? I think our situation would be very similar to yours in New Zealand. Um, I think we would think of um, securities as carrying either sort of debt or equity rights. Um, I can't see... I think these are, if these are going to be regulated anywhere, and I I'm not suggesting they are at the moment, it would be more like in the US seeing this as a, as a form of commodity, if anything at all. Um, I don't really see that as a security as things are at the moment. Yeah. What the interesting thing is also when FEMA said uh, utility tokens they're not regulated unless um, they're non-functional. So they, they still, uh, they have, you're have holding a token which doesn't fit into any functional blockchain environment. So you don't have an application which operates operationally yet, but it's still the promise to deliver that. Does that change the assessment on now from your side, Michael? If there's no what no obligation to deliver, yeah, mostly there is none. Yeah, I'm no, that's, right. that's right. I mean, that's one of the one of the reasons there's so much skepticism amongst the sort of wider community about these kind of um, interests. It, it might, I would say that's more, I don't really see that as in the regulated space. I'd see that there are, certainly could be some legal issues around it. I mean, there could be a, like a breach of contract. You don't deliver what you... Exactly. inherent innovation is that it's not yet established. So to presume that it should be established already is to... Well, look, I mean... It's, ...include and segregate the, look, the ones that are beginning. I mean, that's the point of innovation. Yeah, one of the points I would make, and it's a more of a general point, but I'd make to people who criticise ICOs as a form of uh, funding is that people who, who invest in startup companies through the venture capital route are just as likely to lose their money. Um, it's not, I think, I think I mean, I'm, a great, I'm a great believer in sort of going back to first principles. I think what's going on here, what's the actual, what's the legal arrangement between the two people here? Um, and what's, what's the economic arrangement? And this is just another way of delivery, another form of delivery, really. No. What do you think, Dan? Oh, no, I was just going to yeah. say, you know, a lot of it comes back to poor disclosure. And if you look at a lot of white papers out there, they don't distinguish between the current state, the anticipated future state, and what will happen between now and then. And, and so maybe they can mislead investors mm -hmm. into believing there's a promise that may not exist, you know, and maybe that's where I mean, some of the confusion arises. I mean, our regulator is, much, is, is really interested in this from the perspective of investor protection. Mm -hmm. If if people start losing money in this space and start complaining to the regulator that you're not regulating the space, then that's when they get interested. If it's just carrying on in the background and uh, there's a buyer beware, the regulator's not so bothered at this stage. They've got a lot of awful lot of things going on on their plate at the moment. Uh. Regulate risk, okay, which is what, what we want to do, or what apparently we want to do, is to regulate reward. Because the two are, are two sides of the same coin. So that the, the, the promotion of the idea of regulating risk, uh, clearly early stage ventures involved in digital currencies are higher risk. So to say you want to regulate risk means you want to regulate them out, fundamentally. Making no, explicit risk and loss of money, as the FCA has done, is spot on. Mm. Because they're not, they're not trying to preclude risk. No, no, they just it's... just want to make it explicit. And as you said, we need to make this clear to investors. But so long as the risk is explicit, then we should, we should, it should, it, not, be, we should not be deriding as a society risk in general. Not sure it's buyer beware. It's really what, I mean, that's a very much a sort of, uh, I guess, an Anglo-Saxon legal concept. Buyer, buyer beware, you know what you're getting. Um, you, 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 you had full disclosure, no you knew what you were getting. Yeah, you're not risk threat. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, if there's, if it's clear fraud, that's that's another matter. But I mean, yes, you're right. All invest, I mean, all investment carries a level of risk. Otherwise, why would people do it? And why would entrepreneurs pay them if it was no risk? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, yes, but the I, okay. I think in terms of the disclosure, this disclosure is critical. I think that's why some of the regulators are trying to have it be, in, at least initially, in some cases, a security perhaps migrating to something else. 
Because think about it, even if you have a, a token that it has a functional utility, you're purchasing it for use. If I purchased it at a particular price, right? But actually Daniel got 90% of the tokens for a 90% discount with no lockup. Which would have been great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but how long stable coin just kind of completely goes quantum on it? I mean, if you actually have a utility token that actually is backed by assets or, or regulators, then it's going to be... Well, I think, so, right. I, I do think, I'll address that in one second, but just on the disclosure point for one more second, it's just, I think there isn't, right now there's no framework for what these white papers need to say. And so some of them say very little, or they say a lot, and they don't really tell you anything. And I think that's part of what having something be regulated, kind of telling you what the things are you should be disclosing. Like, what is the pre-mine of the, of the issuer? You know, all kinds of the token seller. But um, in terms of stable coins, I mean, I know many are, are pursuing them. I think, I think they're generally a work in progress, I suppose. And I think even then, having a way to actually verify that each stable coin, if it were in fact a stable coin, is in fact stable and in fact at all times backed up by the assets, that's a whole nother yeah. can of worms. Audit, audit procedures and stuff, but that's not to worry about. I'm just talking about if it actually has a utility and then it gives you access but, to but notifications. But to maybe answer your question, I'm curious what you think of that. I have seen many stable coin projects, but I have never seen one which doesn't the token doesn't have some kind of a counterparty claim in built. So for me, the, the stable coin scenario is, so far as I know, mostly combined as a claim. And then I would say we quite often outside the scope of this counterparty less token, which for us would qualify a utility token. Um, so you're saying that DAI, the counterparty is like a maker? Uh, probably if you take a look on the DAI, there, there isn't a counterparty. There are some stable coins trying to to make the coin stable using smart contracts, and the smart contracts uh, uh, yeah, tries to, to take influence on the amount of money, a little bit like a, a central bank. And there, are, there are some projects, uh, for example, DAI, and also some new ones, uh, which, which try to, yeah. to make a system without counterparty and would, would probably be classified as utility token. Then. Yeah. You could have a special purpose institutional vehicle or corporate vehicle that has an obligation without a corresponding claim to it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it must conform to this behavior under, under a jurisdictional legal standard, but, it, but there's no counterclaim ability. Yeah, but the, the, the that's, point that's there true. is always a bit that if you, if you look at it from an economic perspective, and regulators tend to look at, at constructions from an economic perspective and not from a civil claim perspective, then they would most likely also see there some, some form of a claim against a special purpose vehicle, I, I would assume. Um, with regard to the US, I was curious, would be curious to hear, like now we have this kind of announcement, Ether is no security. Um, has it anything to do with the counterparty idea? So it's interesting that you say that because I, they don't talk about counterparty explicitly. But, and we actually don't have that much visibility into it. Like we have a speech, you know, that was actually a really interesting speech that we've kind of written about now. But but there are parallels because one of the things that that was said was this idea. Like in the U.S., so we have the Howey test, right? Which is it's an investment of money in a common enterprise with a reasonable expectation of profit based solely or primarily on the managerial or entrepreneurial efforts of others. So this efforts of others piece, that is what they're saying right now. No one, when you're purchasing Ether, you know, on the secondary market through Coinbase or wherever, however you're going to purchase it, you're not relying upon the Ethereum Foundation right now for the value of Ether. You're not thinking it's going to rise because of things that they're doing. So in a sense, you could analogize it, I think, I mean, the, the director Hinman didn't do this, but as I'm thinking it through, you could think... There is no person that you point your finger at and say you're responsible anymore because it's sufficiently decentralized. Mm -hmm. So I think there are definitely parallels that one could draw. In Germany, Daniel, is it an idea which Boffin could share? Well, I think um, when it comes to determine whether or not a specific token is a security, um, the concept or the, 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 the range or level of decentralization could play a role, but um, 
Well, the, the biggest issue is that we, we, we still lack any relevant case law um, uh, from, from EU institutions. We don't have any, any case law saying, okay, the, secure, the transferable security definition under MIFID is ABC. A, so um, we, we still need to rely on the, the, the types of, of equity and debt instruments which are explicitly listed in or under MIFID. So, uh, and the level of decentralization could be one concept to, to, to somehow fill out this definition or to, to narrow it down a bit. But um, um, I, to be honest, haven't had a conversation with BaFin about, about the level of decentralization when it comes to determining whether it's, secure, whether it's a security or not. I'm not sure. Well, I think what is pretty clear <laughs> under the current laws is that most of the utility coins who have been accepted as not being securities are clear counterparty tokens, right? right. Uh, and specifically those counterparty tokens which represent uh, a service or you know, a, a non-financial asset. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think we are seeing in the current uh, legal environment, we do not see that reflected. But it's about the uh, kind of... Yeah, exactly. A voucher idea, there are club models out there. Um, also, if, if you acquire basically a license through a token, these things are uh, like marked asset or utility tokens. But I do see in the political area, I do see that the idea of decentralization is recognized as something new, um, some area where we could put some more thoughts in if that could actually create the need of um, the opposite of a technology agnostic framework, um, a more or less technology specific framework, exempting um, maybe a, a specific uh, structure from um, some burdens that are there for, you know, um, um, for profit centralized ventures. Yeah. Although this covers a, a, a rather wide range of, of possible yeah. regulated activities. I think we all so agree that in this first category, uh, um, there are only very, very few current crypto projects would yeah. fit into that category, right? True. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that that's probably due to many also practical aspects. Uh, I think that there needs to be a setup which a utility token, which is counterparty less, makes sense. Uh, Stefan, you want to say share some thoughts on that? Where, where do you believe a utility token makes sense to be made part of a project? Yeah, that's, that's quite a difficult question. Uh, it also depends on the definition of a utility token, but uh, very successful projects use utility tokens if they first create a blockchain infrastructure, maybe on an infrastructural level or on an application level, for example a CRC20 token, but uh, it really makes sense if you have a blockchain project. If you just uh, want to, to raise money using tokens, but if you don't have a, a, a real blockchain project, then probably you're, you better create a, a BCP2 counterparty token, which then provides some, some claims or something like a dividend. But uh, the true uh, utility tokens are, for me, the, the, the real decentralized projects. Mm, no. Well, um, Veronique, in your, your practice in Malta, and I, you know, Malta is one, becoming one of the hotspots for ICOs. Uh, how, how many utility token models do you see? Like, in, is, is it an often case, or is it normally an asset token? Where do you see the projects are heading to in Malta? Um, I would say um, uh, so far there was there, there was um, a keener interest in security tokens and the issuance of that, but I do see. Uh, a niche and an upcoming market for utility tokens and then I explain why because um, until a year ago we were speaking of possibly a hype surrounding this not sure whether this would um, be the way forward and now a year later in Malta it's I think it's the way forward and now that the regulator is um, setting the boundaries and regulating, he is acknowledging and Malta is acknowledging and the way we were thinking is that we, that there is this foresight that utility tokens will be the way forward. Um, uh, and uh, the organic growth in its use that I've observed in these last months um, 
is such that the only way forward is to regulate, to, to make sure that utility um, tokens will be utilized even more. And to my assessment, to my assessment and to my mind, the organic growth globally will uh, eventually, and not eventually, I mean, there's already a, a growing interest now happening, but utility tokens will uh, be um, uh, um, issued more and the interest and the queries about utility tokens, I think will equate eventually asset to uh, security tokens. And this is also because I would say, to my assessment, um, that companies are um, resorting to this and they are evaluating what their position would be utilizing tokens and uh, the investment there is and the, um, the research that's being carried out by corporations um, who are interested in issuing um, tokens and in issuing utility tokens, I would say it would be the way forward for them. It won't be 100% um, usage, but I see an increase. And the organic growth I've seen these last months, I mean, I would definitely say that is the way forward. And there's definitely a future. And there's a lot of hard work. There's a lot of work which still needs to be done. But I can see it growing. Okay. Uh, what do you think, Josh? Now, a, a bit of a critical question. Is, is an ICO the right way to issue a non-utility token at all? Should, we, should that be the mean to issue securities? So, that's a, a great question. I mean, in the U.S., I should say just for a moment, one thing that um, Director Hinman didn't focus on was what about token sales, ICOs, that are done for fundraising purposes as opposed to for consumptive value. So, I think one would, one could say, potentially, that in the U.S., maybe the previously articulated statements that you know, every every ICO I've seen is a security, or that's what Chairman Clayton had said, that maybe that still stands for fundraising, solely for fundraising purposes. There were other things in him in speech that talked about, you know, if you're selling it for consumptive value, sell it to people who are going to use it and get them to use it. You know, like, that's a good demonstration that it was a for consumptive use. You're selling um, your currency. Mm -hmm. Technically, if I sell you some Swiss francs and you pay me in U.S. dollars, I can do anything I want with the U.S. dollars. So, for, so when I'm building a currency, I mean, I don't mind being explicit about how the funds are used, but the regulator shouldn't say, "Hey, you're spending your money for your for to have you know to have um, build a library." Well, that shouldn't be. That shouldn't be I do think that there is a bit of a potential path forward. So I'm I'm not a I'm not the regulator obviously. Um, I do I do in my mind differentiate to a certain degree, just personally between a payment token of the type you're talking about and something that's used for consumptive value within an ecosystem that is not. engineered as a medium of exchange is that it has a specific function but it has to has to build that that's part of the of the of the risk and it is, it is the intention but it, but it's inherent it's, a, it's not it's not accomplished yet. if you get two guys to, to exchange one for a for a pizza then you then you, then is that good enough for the SEC it, or do I we mean, have to all avoid the, the US market? I suppose it's possible I mean Chairman Clayton did say that Bitcoin was not e security Right. But so, are they just protecting the incumbents? Is the question. I mean, I think it's too. So, if I. All right. I'll address that very quickly in two quick parts. One is, I, I believe that what, what he said was more along the lines of unless something looks just like Bitcoin or, or similar. So, I don't think it was limited only to Bitcoin, but it was like some sort of general category. Again, these speeches don't have the force of law. The only law we have is like, is what's in the enforcement actions, which in the case law, like those are the guidance we can look at or cease and desist orders, things like that. But these statements are helpful to figure out how they're thinking about things. So clearly there is, there appears to possibly be some path forward if you have a payment 
type token, right? I, I, in my view, though, if you are selling to U.S. persons right now, unless you are going to interact with the SEC and have some sort of interaction, I think you would be very wise to continue to sell your tokens if you're doing it in a token sale to U.S. persons in the, in the primary sale to treat it as a sale of securities, just to be safe. But you don't have to have any interaction with the SEC to be selling it for a rate deal. Oh, no, 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 I'm saying unless you do that. Okay, so, correct. I guess what I was, to, to clarify, unless you want to say that your token is not a security at all and you're going to be interacting or having your lawyer interact with the SEC and get some comfort on that, then either you would issue it as a sale of securities or under a relevant exemption from securities, such as Reg D, Reg A+, you know, something like that. Yeah. You wanted to add yes. something in that. Yes. So our, our view is probably a little bit different to yours in that I think, well, not so your view, but to, say Chairman Clayton's view, which is he's not seen a utility coin that's not really a security. Our view would probably be more that uh, if it's genuinely a utility coin, it's not a security. But what I'm finding is my clients are sort of seizing on that and saying, well, this is definitely a utility coin. And then we have to ask them a lot of difficult questions around it um, in order to establish whether it's actually really a utility coin or actually some sort of form of hidden security. So those kind of questions I'll ask my clients are, is how is the, what, how is the value going to move this coin? If it's truly an access co a coin to get access to a utility, this shouldn't be a very volatile coin. This should, be a, it should have a fairly standard access, a fairly standard price for access. Um, and you kind of get, and they'll, and they'll sort of respond with things like, well, I don't know, once I've issued the coin, I don't care about it, it's just on exchanges, and et cetera, et cetera. But the reality is they probably should care about that sort of thing. Um, you've also got to ask them about, um, are there any ownership rights coming with a coin? Are you, you I mean, and, and the, under English law, we also have a concept of collective investment scheme, which catches people out from time to time. Um, because most, because there's, there's, in order to, operate a collective investment scheme, you can almost just any, any property rights can count. So if you're operating a, a general scheme... No, I agree. Well. Yeah, I mean, I've got clients who've done exactly that, where they're giving people access to their artificial intelligence. And they could say, oh, the price has gone up because this artificial intelligence is fantastic and it, uh, the artificial intelligence helps you to invest in crypto or helps you to generate value. And when we issued the coin, we didn't know how, gr how great it was going to be. So, of course, you've got a defense against it. But if you're creating a coin which you know is going to massively increase in value and you call it a utility token, I think you have to be really careful. Okay. Thanks a lot. I think we need to wrap up uh, almost a bit over time. Uh, we're going to have some time for questions from the audience again. Just a last question to the round so everybody can comment briefly. We started with the question, is the utility coin dead or will it continue to survive? Um, Rachel, your thoughts on that? Um, definitely not dead, certainly not in New Zealand, but I do think you know, a lot of the raises in New Zealand have been to fund platform development, and if those platforms don't come online so people can actually use their tokens, which again you guys addressed in your paper, then there'll be a loss of confidence. So I think that could be a real um, stumbling block. So they're alive and kicking in the UK, but I think we have to be careful that we're not creating something that's really a security. <laughs> um, utility tokens are definitely not that, but uh, at least on an infrastructural level, we will see that uh, probably there's a need for three, four, five different blockchain infrastructures. So I expect uh, that the market will calm down on an infrastructural level. Yeah. We recognize utility tokens in, in Germany, clearly, I think. Um, um, and we should maybe um, take up the like socio-political discussion um, if we actually categorize these things correctly or if we need to adjust. Yeah, and it's important because um, utility tokens are the basis of, of well, the only means of funding for an open source, fully decentralized network. There is no other way no other proper way to funding fund such a pro project. We wouldn't talk about Ethereum if that wasn't possible. So um, I think from a commercial perspective, uh, utility tokens are far from dead. I think utility tokens are living as we speak in a lot of jurisdictions um, and in the state of Wyoming. 
Um, <laughs> so, I mean, I think, I think we will see them. We will see them. I think right now, at least in the U.S., we're really at the starting point. I mean, I think part of the reason that if I'm just projecting my personal thoughts, which, by the way, none of this was legal advice or investment <laughs> advice. But, <laughs> exactly. That's why I was going like that. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think maybe one of the things that made them start thinking about, well, is there mutability? Could something migrate and be a utility token? Could that exist? Is, you know, they a number of folks in the space started saying, well, wait a minute, the Coda coin, it's being issued as a security. What are you gonna do? You're gonna have the photographer have to upload photographs using a Schwab account? Like, is that really, does that make sense? You know, and, and so we're all at the very early days of figuring out sort of which path to go and how how that works, so. Thank you, and to resonate with everyone else, definitely not dead. I would say that is definitely the way forward, and I see a future and a very positive future for utility tokens. It is the organic use which will determine the way it will develop. So I am yes, we are at the initial stage, and I see that in the next couple of years. I mean, perhaps we'll be discussing fine-tuning and whether what we have now would be adequate to work with in two years' time, but definitely not that, and uh, we would be discussing for sure. Perhaps further definition if the need arises. Great, thanks. I believe we still have a two, three questions from the audience, so we, yeah. Uh, I think we are last So right now, after we get FIMA uh, approval, we have a plan to set up some company overseas. We already set a company in Korea for the issue. The second target is to open a company in America. Our problem is, that problem, our concern is, we spend our token, like we be defined as payment token here, but after we set up a company in US, suddenly we become security token. It is our guess based on the limited information. But uh, our concern from our experience right now, the relationship between Korea and Switzerland. Korea has an unclear guide about Bitcoin. Uh, it costs a lot, and make the business is very complicated. Actually, we, we want to do more business globally. But we don't want to face that kind of uh, complicated situation again in the state because uh, our token became certainly security. Uh, the founders and the people will get scary or we have to go somewhere, we have to submit any papers unnecessarily. So my question is, when we set a company this October in America, so we really have a plan to set a company in Silicon Valley will become security token, so even though we are here payment token. But you have to give legal advice. But I guess the question is, uh, <laughs> let, 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 let me rephrase the question, so you don't have to give legal advice. Is, is there a possibility, without going in depth into token functionality and reassessing the project, project-based approach, to make any general statements that you can ignore to US law? Or would we rather say, well, no, we have to look at it carefully, and it always is a risk that you... I think that's exactly right. I think it is. Not only do you have to look carefully at the law, but every single one of these, because there's no monolithic token, right? Every single analysis is different. Every single token is sold differently. You could, just as an example, since the gentleman over there mentioned Reg Day, right, which is an exemption from registration where you sell only to if you're doing it under 506C, um, you can do general solicitation, but um, only to U.S. accredited investors. You know, if you if you blow that exemption, then you've got a problem, right? Or if you're trying to do it under 506B, where it's supposed to be private, right? But somebody goes on a panel and starts talking about it, then you've blown that exemption. So it, in addition to looking at your token, under U.S. law, you have to look also at who you're selling it to, 
how you verify who you were selling it to, making sure that you can comply with the exemption so you don't have any bad actors, for example, um, that are on the board or something like that, it, that would prevent you from being able to avail yourself of an exemption. It's it's case by case, but I I would say don't I wouldn't assume that you could ignore the us. Yeah. And I think it would probably be also be fair to say that you should look at the US issue not only when you incorporate an entity in the US, but also when you issue something. Actually, when we issued the token, actually we didn't receive any uh, from. I suggest you okay. do that offline. Okay. 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 Any additional questions from the audience? <laughs> All right. Uh, oh, yeah. So, uh, so uh, if you're building like a system, community, like an open source project, and you use ICO as uh, fundraising for liquidity for that community, and then the issuers or like people actually initiate the ICO actually do not get any reward or very little reward, is that still considered like a, a security event? Or? I mean, listen, I would, I think you would need more details on, at least I would need more details to give a clear answer. I know that's not satisfying, but again, like in the U.S., manner of sale matters a lot as well. So if you, if you have somebody on your team who's promoting it saying, hey, this is going to go up in value or something like that, or I'm going to get these put on an exchange so you can have secondary market liquidity, right? Then that's counting a little bit against your, at least at the initial point, against the, the idea. I think you would build something which people, if you have an access, if you have the token, it gives you access to a particular network and nothing else. That's probably a much safer place to be. Yeah. Without giving... Yeah. 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 yeah, absolutely. Well, that... Yes, of course, because you want to be able to use your, use your uh, technology and to build it. But if you have, say, you have, yeah, if you have the token and it gives you access to that technology, but it doesn't give you the, anything beyond that, so it's of no use to anybody who doesn't, who doesn't want to have access to your technology. It's not something people are going to sell on a secondary exchange just for the hell of it. Then I think that makes it look less like a security. One last question. No, I thought it was just a comment for the, for the for people. So I think that we have a problem right now uh, in this chain between the US and Europe and Switzerland because right now some, nobody's saying that, but some people are already giving back the money raised during the next year to US investors because of little constraints and problems with the total issues. And also, some projects are also trying to, to think the way to market their project to. U.S. customers because they are using the token. So there is a high level uncertainty for having in the U.S. And I think that right now we have the, a challenge that is a potential split between markets. Because if a market is compromised, they took the token. Another plan, there is a huge problem there. And this already happening, especially with the ICO market. So I think that this is something that is going to be solved. And probably we need some kind of international agreement for that. But I think it's going to be Take a long time. Actually, it's already a problem. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think lunch is waiting for you all, so you're probably hungry as well. Um, just for your information, this uh, BCP paper and the functionalities the from, a, from a functional perspective and token categorization, this is something we all and others work on and uh, on a cross-border level. Uh, I think there's no alignment yet in detail, but there are many great initiatives, many great ideas, and I think at the end of the day it would be perfect if we could agree on, on definitions so regulators have it easier to uh, withdraw the consequences, the regulatory consequences out of what, what people believe to be, for example, a utility token. I think uh, thanks a lot to the panel. I believe it deserves a great applause. Thank you very much. <laughs>